So uh, good evening, everyone in Japan, and good morning, everyone in Europe. And um, um, hi, hello from Japan to uh, all of you who come from around the world. So today we have uh, the 12th CODH seminar. This is the first time that we do the seminar online. And the title of this uh, seminar is uh, AI for Culture from Japanese Art to Anime. My name is Tarin, and I'm a, a assistant project assistant professor at the Center for Open Data in the Humanities National Institute of Informatics in Japan. And I will be the moderator of this talk. The talk uh, will start soon and uh, I would like you to take um, this time to adjust your um, YouTube resolution. If you're, uh, you're watching from YouTube, if uh, the resolution at the setting is a little bit too low, maybe you see the screen a little bit grainy, but uh, you can change to the higher resolution for so you can see the slide a little bit more clear. And um, the hashtag for this event is CODS12. So if you want to write any um, uh, comments on Twitter or anything, you just uh, use this hashtag and we can reach you uh, by uh, reading the comment. Uh, anything that uh, you want to talk about this talk. And uh, one thing that I want to uh, tell you is that the question for the speaker, we use SlideDo, which is a website that uh, can gather like uh, the questions uh, for the speaker. But uh, you can go to SlideDo by going go to the URL sli.do. And then the event code is uh, CODS12, or you can go to the questions page by this, uh, the QR code on this title page right now. And uh, okay, so uh, I think we got the questions on the YouTube comment. Will this remain on archive? And yes, uh, we will upload this uh, video on archive later. So, uh, you can also check the video, video later if you want to. And okay, I think we should um, start by uh, at, uh, first let's uh, take a look at the schedule for today. Uh, so the opening is like five minutes. I have five minutes to talk and it's already five minutes. <laughs> it's, it's okay. I mean, uh, the, the next talk will start from uh, Shikaiko Suzuki san. He is a uh, uh, also uh, assistant professor at the Center for Open Data in the Humanities. And his talk will be the collection of fresh facial expression and calculated data set. Uh, Suzuki Tang is the person who started this project and um, started doing like gather all the facial expression from the uh, Japanese painting to put all together. And this is, um, that is the starting point of this project. So, uh, and the next speaker will be Alexis. Alexis is from um, EPFL in um, Europe, and he he is uh, he was an um, intern at uh, NII at uh, our our lab to do the face detection for pre-modern Japanese artwork. And then uh, the next two speaker is our guest speaker. We have we are very honored to have guest speaker from Google Brain Tokyo and also prefer network. From Google Brain, we have Ying Tao Tian, who is uh, working on calculated data set, and Yang Huo Jin, who is uh, from prefer network, who work on the anime characters. Uh, if you ever seen like anime Gan or something like that, he is the one who made it. And okay, so because we don't have much time, I think let's get started with the first uh, speaker. Hi. Hi, thank you, Tarin san Okay, I share my slide just a moment. Okay, so uh, let me introduce you, um, the, our speaker, uh, Shikaiko Suzuki. He's, uh, as I mentioned, that he's a project assistant professor from Royce DS Center for Open Data in the Humanities, National Institute of Informatics. And after he studied art history, cultural resource studies, and digital humanity, his, re his main research interest is in applying informatics and open data to humanity research field. Currently, he is focusing on the triple IF uh, research. Okay, uh, I think the presentation yeah. slide is on now. And yeah, um, yeah, Suzuki-san, you can start your presentation. Yeah, thank you. 
Thank you, Tarin-san. Uh, this is my presentation title, Collection of Facial Expressions and Kaokore Dataset. Kaokore is one of the core of this seminar. My, so my presentation is introduction about basic materials of following presentation too. And this is my agenda. First, I make self-introduction shortly, and I talk about collection of facial expressions, Kaokore, and Kaokore dataset. Then I explain making process, how we made Kaokore and why we make Kaokore. And, and last, I expectation of collaboration with machine learning. So self-introduction, my name is Chikahiko Suzuki. I am project, project assistant professor of Royce DS Center for Open Data in the Humanities. I also belong to the National Institution for Informatics. And I am a humanities researcher. My profession is digital humanities, art history, and cultural resource studies. So I'm not machine learning researcher. Uh, if some of you expect all today talk directly concerned with machine learning, I apologize in advance. But my presentation about Kaokore is an introduction about all of this seminar. I was talk about possibility of collaboration with machine learning viewpoint of humanities too. So what is Kaokore? Kaokore is nickname of facial uh, collection of facial expressions. Kao means face in Japanese and Kore is an abbreviation of collection, Kore in Japanese. Kaokore is an image collection of Japanese artworks focusing on facial expressions and each facial expression image in Kaokore has basic metadata, such as status, gender, face direction, or information of original works, and tag, tag means various keywords. We gathered image of pre-modern art, Japan, uh, art works of Japan from multiple organizations in Japan. Now we have 8,845 facial expression in Kaokore. Uh, this is a list of content provider of original artworks. Okay, I'll show you some examples. This is the top page of Kaokore. You can check a list of metadata and you can search facial expressions with clicking metadata or use top search box directory. And this is an example of facial expressions in Kaokore. This is a result of uh, such result of status equal Bushi. Bushi means warrior class in medieval Japan. You can see typical Bushi face like this. They wear samurai armor or samurai style hat. We call it eboshi in Japanese. This is other example. Such result of face direction equal back. Back is rare case. We have only about 700 faces in Kaokore. It is a less than 10% of Kaokore whole faces. You can see men has some variation. Some of them wears armor and some of them wears hat. But women have less, less variety. This is an other type of example. Tag, it may keywords equal Tsukumogami. Tsukumogami is some kind of spirits. In Japanese legend, we use some object over 100 years, the tools become Tsukumogami. So we can identify the original form of tools. C is a spirit of fun. And he is a spirit of pots. And of course, he is a spirit of Japanese style spoon. You can see these various faces in Kaokore from traditional samurai face to this pretty and funny Tsukumogami face. So I talk about Kaokore dataset. Kaokore dataset is a dataset delivered from Kaokore in a format convenient for machine learning. It has text file based data like this content list. And technical detail of Kaokore dataset will be explained by Yun Tao san. So I leave it for him. But there's one thing. Kaokore dataset has only location information of images, not image data itself because we don't want to reduce access to content providers website and we want to support them to further data publication. Next, I explain how and why create Kaokore. 
We cropped from digital Japanese artwork publicly available from multiple organi organizations. When we cropped, we took ad advantage of from IFF. IFF is International Image Interoperability Framework. IFF is an important framework, but not in today's issue. So if you want to know about IFF, please visit this URL. And we use IFF creation platform to create Kaokore. IFF creation platform is developed by CODH, it is our team. IFF creation platform enables us to crop image from the world's IFF compatible website and handle its metadata. Kaokore making process has two steps. First, we bordered and cropped every facial expressions on artworks. This is very simple task, but hard manual work. Japanese artworks, especially emakimono, picture st scroll, it is the main target of Kaokore, has a lot of scenes, and each scenes have many facial expressions. So we try to crop face, crop face, crop face, crop face in manually <laughs> over 8,000 faces. Second step, we add metadata to every facial expressions. This is also hard work and not simple work. We need to check reference of art history many times. This step needs specialized knowledge of Japanese art history. So why we take this trouble to make Kaokore? We have a purpose. CODH aim to promote data-driven research in humanities. And we, art historian, compare details of artworks for identification of painter for long times. This is basic method of style, method of style competitive studies in the art, art history field. We have used scissor and paste in manual way. So image collection cannot be shared or reused easily. I'll show you an example. This is an example of traditional way research from great previous work by Dr. Aizawa. Professional art historian compare facial expressions cropped from two artworks for identification. Red block is painting identifies a painter and blue box is a known work. We make technical discussion with face, this face is similar, it is similar or not, and so on, and identified painter. And there's a limit to share and reuse it with research based on manual works, such as paper or photocard. And Kaokore give us shareability and usability of cropped image in digital way. For example, we can create derivative image collection from Kaokore and share on the internet. And if other researchers want to check whole original works, they can follow a link on derivative image collection to original works. Art historians can discuss based on research data with Kaokore style researches. This is intro introduction of Kaokore and humanity research with digital technique. And at last, I talk about the expectation of collaboration with machine learning and humanity researches. I have a lot of expectation from the viewpoint of humanities, humanists, but first and most important to me is creating basic research data. Creating basic research data of Kaokore is hard work as I expected yet. And image recognition about facial expression on Japanese artwork can be great help. Of course, increase Increasing the number of facial expression images will provide rich training data for machine learning. And I think this issue will be talked on the next Alex Sands presentation. There's other expectations. This is only on my imagination, but I think machine learning may be able to visualize unconscious decision of art historians. When we, art historians, compare facial expressions, we always discuss about typical expression of the painter or typical expression of this artwork. But actually this typical is ambiguous. Typical expression characterizes the artwork, but it is not most frequent expression in the artwork. So I imagine some kind of image recognition help us to make objective indicator of our decisions. 
Oh, this is final slide of my presentation. Some people want to race against machine learning, and some people use machine learning as an oracle, but we don't want to do it. We want to collaborate and cooperate with machine learning. We hope calculated data set is a one of the trigger for these collaborations. Thank you for your attention. This is uh, my presentation end. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Suzuki san for your presentation. And uh, so we have uh, one question about the calculated data sets. Is yeah. the calculated data sets available in other language uh, other than Japanese? And uh, I have one question to ask you, uh, especially like uh, you said that calculated, uh, we collect 8,800 um, yeah. faces by hand manually, right? I just want to know how much time did you use roughly yeah. to collect our 8,000 um, faces? Yeah. Yeah, it is uh, about uh, two. Uh, we create uh, calculate in two years, but uh, to total work uh, time is, uh, I think, yeah, I don't think exactly time, but uh, about six months to create this 800, 800, uh, over 8,000 page collection, crop, and metadata. And it takes many time to add metadata. Yeah. Okay. And uh, uh, they are asking, like, uh, do we have plan to expand calculated data set in the future? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, I expand more and more facial expressions mm -hmm. in Kaokore in future. Yeah. And okay, one last question before we change to the next speaker. How did you assign the gender for catching a monster? Like, uh, how can you tell the if the monster is male or female? <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's a very different question. Yeah, many, many, mainly depending on. Uh, at historians' uh, reference of uh, some books or uh, previous studies. So it is uh, case by case, but uh, I show, uh, yeah, this uh, this is a uh, monsters and they, they have a uh, gender. But uh, basically, in this in this time, uh, many monsters in Kaokore uh, wear the uh, clothes and which uh, it identified, we, uh, we can identify with these girls, uh, this monster, our uh, uh, spirits is uh, male and female. But uh, I think uh, um, I, I know uh, uh, gender is unknown uh, pattern as, uh, appear in future, I think. <laughs> it's case by case. Okay, thank you so much. So, um, so because we don't have much time right now, let's move to the next speaker. And we will have the final discussion again after all the talk done. And I will ask more questions because so many questions on slide do actually. And yeah, I will uh, wrap up at the end later. So mm -hmm. uh, right now, so let's uh, prepare to go to the next talk. Um, so uh, if you just uh, join this uh, seminar online, I would like to tell you that. So the next talk will fr be from uh, Alexis. He is, a, uh, he is a master degree student from uh, EPFL and also interned at NII for the last six months. But yeah, he was in Japan, but unfortunately because of the COVID-19, he had to go back uh, a lot earlier than uh, than the schedule, but anyway, he did a really good, great work on the Kaokore data set and he studied first communication system and follow with the master degree in data science. So, uh, okay, uh, Alex, okay, uh, yeah. um, okay, your slide is ready. So if you uh, just join this uh, presentation, the hashtag for this uh, event is uh, CODS12. And if you have any questions, you can ask on slide do and put the um, event code CODS12 in uh, slide do as well. So any questions that ask on, uh, Asked on YouTube won't be asked to the speaker at the end, but uh, the questions on the slide do will be asked and I will try to wrap up everything at the end again. Okay, so uh, please Alexis, thank you so much. Okay. So hi everyone, so my name is Alexis and today I'm gonna talk about face detection and pre-modern Japanese artworks for semi-automatic annotation. So first of all, I would like just to thank all the people that work with me. So Kitamoto Sensei that took care of me at NII Suzuki-san and Tagagishi-san that participated in the project, and also other person that work on Kaokore. 
also on the ground data set, the people that allowed us to use all these artworks, and finally, the people that implemented the MM detection library that we used a lot for experiments. So to start during this presentation, I'm going to quickly talk about the cargo collection once again. I'm really sorry, but <laughs> we have to. Then uh, I'll quickly present the deep learning architectures we use, what metrics we use for evaluation, Finally, what method we implemented to have good results in detection. Then I'll show you some experiments result. And finally, how we achieved to label a new collection from scratch. So first of all, uh, it's pretty clear that our goal is to propose an automatic face detection on pre-modern Japanese artwork so that we are able to reduce the time needed by art historian to fully annotate a collection. So for given an image like on the one on the right, what we want to obtain is using a deep learning based object detector bounding boxes that corresponded to correspond to the faces of each characters in an artwork so, and to do so we want something that is efficient with a good precision and recall and also really time reducing so here you can see a zoom in version where in red you have the grand truth uh, face that was labeled by an art historian and in green the one that was found using our detection framework so once again, the Karako collection, as you have seen before, is a collection of face partial expression from pre-modern Japanese pictures, scrolls, and picture book. And all these faces originate from uh, 14,070 original drawings. And what we get from that is that we have a pretty small data set, which can be problematic for machine learning based research. The faces are already cropped, and that's not what we need when working on detection. And finally, as you can see, the data is not uniformly distributed since it comes from different scrolls and books. So what we did first was using the purple IF standard, we achieved to recover the full images. So as you can see here from cropped face in the collection category, we achieved to obtain the cropped face as bounding box in the original image that we could then could use for face detection. And finally, we also came with multiple ways to split the data because as we said before, random split is not good enough because of the unbalance of data. So what we made was two type of splits, one called interbook that consists of saying that either a book is available for training, either it is not and thus only kept for tasting. And on the other end, the intrabook split that is more general and so span all style because we say that all books are available except for some of the pages that are kept for testing. So now we'll quickly present to you our deep learning architecture. So we used pretty standard architectures and didn't really change anything to them. And so the first one we used was called signal shot detector, which is pretty simple conventional based architecture. And the idea behind it is using like predetermined uh, region proposal that consists of region that the network will look for image in. So it's like a zoom in some kind of region that the network would take interest in. It used like multiple feature maps and intermediate feature maps to compute its output and its detection. Then we have also more difficult and more modern architectures, for example, faster CNN, which this time is like a shared region proposal network with a classification network, both of them so sharing features. And the proposal network gives region to the classifier that we use them as an idea of where to look for faces. This detector, this detector allows to find faces as different aspect ratio, which is really cool and really important in our case because some faces are pretty small. Then in the same idea, we have also tried Cascader CNN detector. It's the same idea of faster CNN. We want to be able to find faces as different aspect ratio, but you do it differently by using like a cascade of different detectors so that each detector following one other are more and more precise and are more and more high quality. Then the big part of our project was to create or better said, adapt the image patching approach. So we took inspiration from style detection, for example, recognizing a author from a paint for a painting. And because of data was our resolution artworks with lots of details, we were like, we don't want to lose de these details when doing the detection work. Because in most of the case, when using a detector, you have to resize your input to enter the detector. So our goal with this method was to allow image to be pass, passed to the detection architecture while avoiding the resizing process. And here you can see we have an algorithm for, 
form of the method and the right some example and we could quickly go through it. So what we do is given like a list of artworks and a patch size. So you want, for example, rectangular patch of given size. We are going to patch the image according to the patch size so that we can correctly crop a finite number of patch of, for example, size S in this image. So here on the right, we can see that you have, we have red patch and green patch. And in fact, green patch are used so that they shared area with four other red patch so that we are certain to not miss any faces during the patching process. Then each patch are detected by the detector so that we find all faces in each patch. And finally, we put everything back together in the original name and do an, a supplementary non-maximum suppression step so that we remove all overlapping bounding box and all duplicates. So this is our approach we use. And then to evaluate our, our results, we, ba we base our research on pretty standard metrics or recall precision, mean average precision map, and also the IOU that is, in fact, the Jacker overlap. So now we'll dive into our experiments and what we did. So first of all, we have some hyperparameters during our research, and we fix them for most of the experiments. We have, for example, a prediction score threshold that's say 2.5. We have gamma, the Joker of lab threshold used by the extra NMS step in the image patching approach that is set to 0.3. And finally, a really important threshold that is theta that corresponds, in fact, to how we choose training samples. Because when choosing training samples, we take only samples that contain faces. And we want to know if a faces is enough of a faces, so, which means that we need to take care of is enough of the faces in the patch so that we can consider it as a face that we want to train on. And this threshold is change how much we need the bounding box corresponding to the phase in the patch to correspond to the original one we image. All experiments were run on the intrabook splits of the Karakore and the same intrabook splits for comparability. All the network were pre-trained on ImageNet because we wanted to benefit of the transfer learning because it can be really helpful for a small data set. And finally, our experiments were run using MM detection and SpyTorch. Uh, also, everything was trained using SGD optimizer with really standard parameters, and I will not really go through them because it's not really interesting. So the first experiment we ran was thinking about what we could do with Kalkore and what we could do face detection-wise. So we tried every type of split of the data with a simple SSD detector and the image patching method. And as you can see in our result here, we achieved to say that our approach generals pretty well on the data set. And because of the result on the interbook split here of around 70%, we can see that we can transfer from already seen books to never seen ones, despite the color palette changing, the style changing, the material changing. Also, we can see that the best case scenario is when we are av av uh, able to train on all kinds of artworks, as you can see with our interbook. Then what we did was testing our image patching approach. And here we tested the free architecture with different patch size. And as you can see, the image patching approach, for example, for SSD, allowed to have a big boost in quality in mean average precision, around 30%, which is pretty big. And for other architecture, which are more modern, we achieved to always gain around 1% with, for example, this patch size of uh, 1,333 times. So from that, we saw that first image patching seems to work. And it seems to keep the details. And also, image patching must be so that the patch size is adapted to the architecture. For example, here, 600 by 600 did not work well with faster ECNN because faster ECNN awaits an input of size 1,333 times 800. So here, I'm going to show you some detection examples, which will be like more fun to, to see using a faster ECNN with image patching. So here, on the left side, you have a result using the image patching approach and the right side without image patching. And while zooming in here, you can see that image patching allows to find more characters, so only one face in a more, but also that the precision and the score the network output is far higher than the one obtained without using image patching. Here you have another example where you can see in the karaoke recollection that image patching allows to find this character laying down. And when not using it, we were not able to find it. So finally, the last experiments we ran was tuning the threshold theta that's used for finding the training samples. And as you can see in this table, it has a pretty big influence on how the network works. And when this threshold is, for example, set to 0.6, we arrive, we arrive to like obtain a, 
an accuracy in our mean average precision, sorry, of around 83%, which is like four points higher than what we have without image patching, which shows that the method needs to be carefully used with carefully selected training samples, and that it could help a lot for increasing the detection quality. With all these results, what we did after that was trying to label a new collection. So this collection is abridged to Kuon, and we were lucky enough to be able to work on it. And contains multiple picture scrolls, so 336 pages that are split in 10 books. So what we did is we did the detection project uh, detection with the image patching using a faster SCNN with the threshold fixed to some value, and we trained it on the calc recollection. And here you're gonna see some example of what we obtained. So you can see that we have really crowded artworks with a lot of faces, and our network achieved to find a lot of them. Even if we have some problem with backfacing character or the one wearing ads hiding their faces, but in general, our network achieved to find most of the characters and their, their faces, which is really interesting. So then what we did was sending all these results to art historians because the goal of, of our framework is not just to find faces, it's to help art historians to find these faces and correctly label them. So with these results, they had four choice. So either the box we sent to them, so the faces was correct, or it was slightly correct, so needing some modification to be like perfect, or it was a false positive, so saying this was not a face, or a false negative, like we missed a face. So based on different restrictions, so for example, case one corresponding to, we say that all faces that were nearly right were in fact right, case two corresponding to say, these faces nearly right were right if only if they shared at least uh, an IOU of 0.5 with the Grand Truth Mountain Box found by art historians. And finally, the case three was considering all the second type of boxes, so nearly correct as false. We can see that the precision we have on a new collection is pretty high, always around 85%, which is really impressive. And that our recall, even though it dropped more when we consider these nearly faces as false, is still pretty good around. 66%. So from that, we evaluated the time we saved for the art historians during the work. And after discussing with them that the time they take to, for example, accept uh, a bounding box is nearly new, to remove one here is nearly new, and finally to modify one is also nearly new. We only considered that the time to add a box had to be considered, so one for a box that we missed. And from that, we achieved to say that we saved them around two thirds of the original time meaning that they take only one third of the time they would have taken without using our framework to label like the full data set, which is a pretty big saving time. And also they told us that, I didn't focus on it here, but this method allowed them to, for example, be certain to not miss any faces. So in conclusion, what we did during this project is train an efficient face detector on the Karakao collection so that we were able to label a new collection from scratch reducing a lot the cost of detection to only one third of its original cost. And that showed that we can transfer our framework on new Japanese collection. Also here, uh, we only tackle the, pro the, the task of detection, so the detection step, and in that annotation in general consists also into labeling the faces with metadata, which take a long time. And this labeling task could be also automated in the future. And finally, what we could do is like fully automate the whole process, as I said, do both the detection and the classification at the same time, since it seems possible. And finally, keep training our detector using a loop like using the new curated collection. So for example, Kuon, we can retrain the detector so that we have a detector that becomes more and more precise with time. So thank you very much for your attention. And that's all for this presentation. Okay, thank you so much, Alexis. Uh, before we move to the next speaker, I have uh, one question from slide two. Uh, do you have any problem that the face is bigger than your any of your patches, or and if the face is uh, bigger than your patches, will it create a problem? Uh, yeah, it could be problematic, but luckily enough, uh, for example, the patch size of six hundred times six hundred seems to be the minimum size, so that if the face is is fully in the patch, it will be fully like found, it will not be too big. Because for example, uh, using an SSD 300, the input should be like 300 for time 300. And, but using this type of patch, 
sometimes we were not certain to have the full faces and we'll cut the faces or the faces will be too big, which can be problematic. So at least with the patch size we tried here, we were nearly certain that no faces were too big for it. Okay, thank you so much, Alexis, and, and for your uh, great talk. And uh, we will uh, ask you more questions uh, at the discussion later. So uh, let's move to the next speaker, which is uh, Jingtao Tian from Google Brain Tokyo. So uh, Jingtao is a research software engineer at Google Brain Tokyo, and prior to that, he obtained his PhD from Stony Brook University in uh, 2019. So he just joined Google. And uh, his research interest is about um, generative models and representation learning, as well as their applications in natural language processing, knowledge-based modeling, social network, and more. His current focus is concern the intersection between generative model agents and interact with uh, external worlds, world, as well as bridging machine learning with humanity research. So uh, Ying Tao, can you, uh, okay. And uh, can you share the slide, please? Okay. Oh. Uh, I, I cannot hear you. Uh, I still cannot hear you. It's only me or <laughs> okay. We have a little uh, mic problem for Ying Hao. Uh, okay. Uh, because uh, Ying Tao seemed to have a problem with uh, his microphone, so uh, let's. Switch to the next uh, presenter first. Is uh, Yang Ho is here? Okay, I'm okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, let me introduce you first. And uh, uh, Yang Ho Jin, he's a, a research research engineer at the Prefer Network. And before he obtained an undergrad degree in computer science and engineering from Fudan University in Shanghai, China, and his research interests include include deep learning, uh, deep generative models and its application to Japanese animes and games, which is really cool. And he found that the crypt Cripco project to build the real world application of anime deep generative model before joining the preferred network. So uh, please welcome uh, Yang Huo Jin. Okay, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Correct. Okay, Fine. let's start. Okay, thank you. Hi, Hi everyone. This is Yang Huo Jin from Prefer Networks. We already have two wonderful talks on machine learning with traditional Japanese arts. In contrast, in this session, I would like to focus on some kind of contemporary Japanese artwork. Yeah, the anime arts. Specifically, I would like to share about our latest progress on anime character creation. How we build practical system to support animators to create their ideal anime characters and automatically animate characters from a single illustration. To begin with, I would like to share a visualization of mark sizes related to anime in Japan. In 2017, anime industry generated more than 2,000 billion yen revenue. Among them, more than 11% are for professional anime studios. However, compared to professional market, Another noticeable market is for animator creators. For example, they make doujinshi and sell it 
sell them in coming market. The passion for creation from both professional creators and amateur creators is pushing the world industry and building a huge global influence. So we have the need to create. What is that keep people from creative activities? To some extent, personal hard work is needed before we can create anything artistic. However, sometimes there is a tool missing that is easy to use for the beginner. For such a tool, the user can immediately start to create and gradually master how to use it. Considering the revolutionary development in the generative deep learning, especially the GANs, can we leverage the much power of GANs to help creative activities? Back to 2017, we started to explore the probabilities of creating anime characters by adopting GANs. We built the Make Girls Moe. The project is built on a GAN variant called Drygan. For better control of the model, we manually select some conditions as the input. For example, user can start spe specify input attributes like hair colors or hairstyles. Another interesting project I would like to mention is Wife Labs released last year. It's also a game-based anime character generator. But as you can see, they decompose the character creation progress into three steps, namely color, details, and the pose. User can explore the model by selecting different styles in, diff in different layers. The method directly benefits from the disentangled properties of the style gain latent space. In previous networks, our mission is to leverage the power of generative deep learning so that even an amateur can experience the joy of creation. As a company-wise goal, we have developed Patalika Pen for line drawing coloration and the Crypto platform for anime character creation. So the first major challenge is how to create characters with precise control. Let's begin with an analysis of previous approaches. As far as I know, all existing work for anime GAN use latent space manipulation approach. They first encode images into, a feature, vec into feature vectors, doing some affine transforms on feature vectors and decode the manipulated feature vectors back into the image space. This method is quite simple, but a critical issue is the lack of explainability, with the result that doing precise control is quite difficult. What if we can decompose the latent space into two orthogonal factors, one for shape and another one for textures? A possible solution is to create spatial texture maps directly aligned with the semantic segmentation maps by individually manipulating the segmentation map and the interpolating the texture map, the system can disentangle the shape and textures, which enables us to control them precisely. Here comes to our workflow. During the training, we encode the image into a spatial feature map along with a Facial segmentation map, they are combined with the shape pooling module and inject into the decoder with uh, the spatial normalization module. We adopt the L1 reconstruction loss, VGG loss, and the GAN loss for the end to end model training. Also, there's a paper called shown in this year's CVPR, which used a very similar approach, but actually, our system is developed independently in last year's summer, so it's just a coincidence. To achieve shape agnostic texture maps, we apply the average pooling to the encoded feature map constrained on each semantic regions. 
which result uh, n number uh, n semantic regions of length c, uh, semantic vectors. After that, we expand all feature vectors back into the three D space according to the desired semantic shapes to inject the texture feature along with the segmentation map. We design a two-step architecture with spatial add-in. The first group of add-in parameters generated from the expanded texture feature. Then it is used to modify the converged segmentation map and generate another set of add-in parameters, which finally be applied to the decoder feature map. In the text stage, we calculate segmentation map and the texture map from two different inputs, mixing two texture maps according to the corresponding semantic regions. As you can see, the mixed enemy girls on the right side looks the same as the upper left girl, but also has similar texture as the lower left girl. Here is a demonstration of the model. As you can see, a user can easily manipulate the segmentation map and interpolate latent styles with the help of web, our web interface. For skilled illustrator, even drawing from scratch only takes a few minutes. Until now, we have discussed new ways to create characters. The next goal is more challenging. Can we animate characters from a single image for either general one or hand-drawn illustrations? So how to animate characters from a single image? The first thing comes to my mind is to use neural networks to generate animation clips. The winking clips shown on the right side is generated by latent feature interpolation approach. This, the result is quite cool, and especially the eye movement looks very natural. However, this approach suffers from some unavoidable drawbacks. First, tuning precise control is quite hard as everything is in a black box. Also, Neural networks always require a huge computation power to achieve real-time generation results, which looks unrealistic for edge devices like smartphones, as there is no existing library can handle neural network-based animation for game development, 
very difficult to integrate them into a practical system. Another approach is to use 2D mesh triangulation and morphing. Actually, this kind of method has already been widely used in game industries. It's totally expandable and controllable. Even on low-end smartphones, morphing animation can be rendered very smoothly. Let's first look at an interesting paper called Brain Portrait to Life, which was, which was published in the Graph Asia three years ago. They use a reference video to get optical flows and applying optical flows to the target facial key points. After that, morphing the triangulated meshes to follow the movement. Their method can animate portrait paintings very smoothly. By the way, there already exist some apps using similar approach like MagLabs. However, directly applying such method on animate, animate images often generate weird results. By analyzing the results, we believe the major issue is the lack of layer separation for each facial part. As you can see in the video, eyebrows and hair got totally entangled in a single layer. If you look closer, different from real people, anime characters always have very long front hair, and the very thin eyebrows, which makes the 2D mesh morphing very hard without a fine grained layer separation. We believe layer separation is the key to make a practical character animation system. Let's first look at an overview of the most popular 2D animation engines, Live 2D, Emote, and the spine. Here is the comparison of three engines. Among them, Emote is the simplest one. Especially, Emote have, has a very powerful template system, which means if you create a layer separated PSD file following the predefined layer name, Emote editor can automatically handle it and convert it into animation data with a rich set of template animations. For such a reason, we started to build a layer separation system for ML. Here is a, a, here is the specification of a simple ML template. To fit a PSD file to a basic template, it should contain separated layers shown on the right like eyebrow, eyelash, eyebrow clothes, body, front hair, or back hair. This is a demonstration video from MO. You can find how it works. Here is an overview of our layer separation system for emote. In first step, we extract eyebrow, eyelash, iris, white of the eye, and the mouth layers from the face. Next, we extract face outline, body, front hair, and back hair layers from the upper body image. Our model can generate fine-grained facial part segmentations even for very thin areas like eyebrows can be captured precisely. For regions of hairs and faces, 
they have very large overlaps to deal with the occlusion. We estimate a model mass for each region and impend hidden areas. The back here, body, front hair, or uh, the face outline, front hair. Finally, by inject separated layers into ML templates, we can easily build an animation clips. In this talk, I have shared about our new workflow of anime character creation. To summarize, we can estimate semantic segmentation maps for a given character image. By adopting those maps, we can separate a single image into different layers and recompose them into animation clips. Meanwhile, semantic segmentation maps can be used as a guidance to edit and generate new characters. Thank you for your attention. That's all my talk today. If you have any questions, you can ask me here. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Yang Huo. And we got so many questions on uh, slide two. I'll ask you a few questions before we move to uh, Ying Tao. So uh, the first question that uh, we got for you is, can you tell us how you obtain semantic segmentation of anime face images? What data did you use to train and what architecture did you use? Um, actually, um, this is a collaboration with some, uh, some Japanese companies and we obtain data from those companies. And so I cannot tell too much about that. Okay. So uh, the next question is that does that, that style image need to be generated from GAN or is it arbitrary source image? And it can be arbitrary source image. Okay. And uh, and uh, for the copyright reasons, we only show GAN generated result here. So everything you use in the slide is GAN generated. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, mm, to uh, avoid some copyright issues. Yeah, I, I'm sure that the copyright issue is a um, a big problem for like uh, anime, but your results look really good and very natural, like uh, in the animation. So one last question: How did you train the layer separator? What data did you use? Oh, it's actually the it's a very complicated system. You need to handle a lot of edge edge cases, and uh, uh, as a result, I haven't write details on the slide, but maybe we will publish, a, we will try to um, publish a paper on it later, so you can wait. Okay, thank you so much for your talk. It's a really great talk and we are honored to have you. And uh, let's uh, ask more questions uh, after of the uh, after Ying Tao's talk. And uh, one question that I, we got from slide two is that can we get the slide from speaker later? And I would say yes, the YouTube uh, video and the slide will be online uh, for download um, af after the talk, after some time, after we edit the video. And so <clears throat> the last speaker today is uh, Ying Tao Tian from Google Brain. Uh, can you heard? Yes, this yes, time. Yes. Okay, nice. <laughs> okay, can you turn on your camera too? <clears throat> yeah, one second. Can I be seen? Uh, yes. Okay, so I'm starting my presentation. Mm, so first, uh, sorry for the trouble, but I know that uh, the Real-time debugging is also something as an engineer we always facing. So okay, so let me start. Mm, I'm in Tao uh, from Google Brand Tokyo, and uh, definitely thanks uh, for this for having 
the chance to give a talk uh, that I'm going to talk today. This is a work on the Kaokole, a pre-modern Japanese artificial expression dataset. And uh, as this is a joint work actually with the collaborators, Chikahiko Tarin Asanobu from the Japan's National Institute of Mathematics, who are also in this talk, and with Alex from the University of Montreal and Michael from the University of Cambridge. Before diving into the detail, so I am a, now a software engineer in Google Brain Tokyo, and uh, Tarin has uh, talked about my background, so I think I can skip this slide. And now uh, I'm going to just uh, go over through the agenda for this um, for my part of the talk. Um, I will be first covering the pre-modern Japanese literature, and then after that, I will be uh, covering uh, our contribution, the Kaokole dataset, followed by the quantitative results, and uh, mostly, uh, I think mostly interesting, the qualitative or creative results. Okay, so let's start with the with the first side, the pre-modern Japanese literature. Um, so I'd like to talk about this um, before diving into our work. Um, as a background, uh, in pre-modern Japan, there is a web-established narrative form or storytelling where the stories are displayed entirely as one long continuous painting, usually in the form of a picture scroll or a picture book. So often the painting is accompanied by the cursive writing of the story. Here illustrated is a cropped page of the tale of the hollow tree of Usuho Monogatari, which is a late, late 10th century Japanese story and presented here in the form of a picture book or a home that was made in the 17th century. And as you can see here, uh, in this cropped page, on the left, it has a cursive text telling the story. And additionally, on the right, there's a story explaining paintings depicting many characters on the right. And often these two parts are on the same page. So such kind of form provides valuable material uh, for the study of Japanese art history from a humanity research point of view. And recently, uh, what we want to explore is that we want to see how to make humanity research benefit more from machine learning and uh, what can this kind of combi combination um, be providing such as uh, insight being provided to the research. So one of the comments from our colleagues in the humanity research is that it might be a good idea to think about the way machine learning can or cannot be used for humanity research. So actually, the advances of machine learning has been accelerating researchers way beyond its traditional fields. Um, for example, we have recent models that has been proposed for transcribing historical Japanese cursive writing, uh, which is called Kuronet. And uh, it has been a work that uh, was done uh, in NII. So this is uh, actually a pretty hard task, even for the trained human researchers. So this is a good example in an area of history and humanity where the better and the relevant machine learning model can have a more direct and immediate impact on the society. But there's a missing elephant in the room, uh, which is the illustrations and especially the faces, uh, since the facial expression differs uh, a lot and they also offer specially rich information not only about the content, but also about how the artworks were created. And actually this can be very helpful for the comparative style study, which is a typical approach to answer the research questions about the artwork. And so that we hope this can also be benefit from the recent advances of machine learning researchers, just like the case of cursive writing. And in this direction, and to accelerate such kind of comparative study in the art style, uh, there has been some effort. For example, this one called the Facial Expression Collections 
is a public accessible project provided by the Center for Open Data in Humanity in the National Institute of Informatics. This is the foundation on which we further build this work. As illustrated here is a, is a facial expression collections that basically provides a data set of a cut out and a collected parts of the faces extracted from the Japanese artworks from the late Muromachi period of the 13th century to the early Edo period of the 17th century. Uh, it also provides corresponding metadata annotated by researchers with domain expertise. So it facilitates research into the art history, especially in the study of artistic style. Given the success of applying machine learning into cursive writing recognition, we believe that this official expression collection can also provide a largely unexplored opportunity and to bridge the research of a historical Japanese artwork with the machine learning research. But it has its own issue that it is not designed um, per se for the machine learning in terms of data format, image sizes, and um, et cetera. So which is an obstacle for the easy adoption of the machine learning techniques. Now I have covered the background of the pre-modern Japanese literature and our hope to bring machine learning to it. So I now will be covering Kaokole dataset, which is our contribution towards this direction. So to bridge the gap we mentioned before, built upon the facial expression collection, we propose to make a machine learning and friendly dataset. Uh, we make our data set with the faces that you can see on the right side of the slide. And we named it Kaokole, which was uh, already being explained by Chikaki Kosan. This is a short of official expression collection in its original Japanese. Basically, now I would like to talk a little bit about the data set itself. The Kaokole data set contains totally more than 8,000 colored images of this cutout of face each of them being in 256 by 256 resolution. Actually, this processing makes the resulting data set easy to use with the off-the-shelf machine learning models and tools. So in fact, the format of the images follows that of the ImageNet because we want to make it a potential dropping replacement data set for many of the existing architectures. And besides the images, it also contains a full metadata labeled by the experts. So in this example, you can see that uh, the metadata for the image shown here contains such as a year of creation, the gender, social status, and where this work uh, was coming from. And to make it useful for supervisor machine learning, we also provide two sets of the labels of all faces the gender and the social status, which belong to the frequently appearing subset of all these expert annotated labels. This example image is show here shows the, our, our class and the labels. And the, this example is pretty much explaining themselves. For example, for the genders, we have the male and the female. And for the social status, we have noble, warriors, incarnation and commoners. Notice that we only collect and we only choose the labels and the classes that are most frequently um, appearing because we want to focus on what has been appearing uh, most frequently, most useful for the research. And uh, definitely there are some labels that are appearing only once or twice or just a few times and they are also valuable, but we left it uh, for the future study. Equally important for the supervised machine learning, we also provide the official training, developing and testing split to allow a straightforward comparison of different machine learning models so that uh, the comparison can be easily done in a fair, in a fair way. Now I have uh, discussed the Kaokole data set and uh, let's move to some quantitative results. And as you can see, the value of our data set can be shown through a few types of experiments. And the first of them is the quantitative classification result. This basically shows the supervised learning task 
of classifying the gender and the status. Here, the machine learning models are required to classify whether a given image is a male or female character and the character's social status, such as being a noble, being a warrior, incarnation, and the commoner. And as you can see here, we show the results of several commonly used neural networks, which are able to achieve decent but imperfect performances. We also find that definitely the newer and the larger architectures often achieve better performances, but they still do not do it perfectly. So we believe that the data set provides room for the future improvement on the machine learning model side. And now I'd like to talk about something that's more interesting because the calculated data set itself is based on artworks. So we definitely want to investigate uh, its creativity application. So in this sense, we want to see that if the humanity research side can find the novel ways of engaging this data set artistically, then the best way to do that is to use a good performing generative models. And uh, we first explore the generative adversarial networks or the GANs, which has been successfully uh, applied in many tasks, such as uh, synthesizing high quality images. Uh, so in this task, we use a style GAN, which was the state of the art GAN at the time of writing. Uh, we implemented and trained it on our data set, and we show the generated images here. So all of these ancient faces are generated by the GAN model. And if you can see in this video, we show an infinity number of generated ancient faces. It can be definitely been watched for uh, forever. But the basic story here is that we are to show a very diverse yet coherent style generated by this model. In the hope that we want to have the art history research side to see the different approaches to the art through machine learning and uh, use that probably uh, in a comparative way. And here we show the generated and the real data. So there's definitely still rooms for improvements. But we also show that we can achieve the right balance between the diversity and the visual quality. GAN models here are being able to generate somewhat plausible looking faces of the images. But fundamentally, GAN objects require that the model to directly generate pixels. This is much different than how human artists might pen an illustration, since an artist would simply pen the, the image by applying stroke iteratively on a canvas. So therefore, when a GAN makes mistake, the type of error it makes are generally quite unlike the variation that could be produced by a human painter. So to give this synthesized process a more artwork-like inductive bias, we consider the stroke-based rendering, which produces a reference painting by subsequently drawing primitives, such as simple strokes on the canvas. And we first explore applying a work called intrinsic style transfer by Nakano. This work is with the strokes in the art style looking pretty like the colored pencil drawing. It is named by the fact that it's lacking the style loss, which in turn exposes the intrinsic style derived from the choice of such primitives, the pencil drawing style like sketches. So it can be observed that the images can be decomposed into the strokes that resembles how a human artist might create the pencil sketches. And as you can see here, there are more examples of a different kind of uh, faces being painted in this way. Actually, notice that the model has not been provided with any recording of the sketch sequences because all the painters has passed away centuries ago. The model have to, by itself, find a way to compose this. And we find that uh, the Nakano's model does pretty good way in introducing the pencil sketch-like style into the painting. We also explore another work, which is titled Learning to Pen. This is a work published last year by Huang et al. This one is a neural painting model with many diff different aspects. But I think what uh, differentiates itself from others uh, mostly is that it tries to approximate the image using, a, using very simple regions. 
these regions were marked by the quadratic basal curves. And the model is using a deep learning approach to decompose the target image into as few as possible such kind of simple uh, regions. And with more images shown here, this model generates the sequences of painting much different than the brush of strokes we shown in the previous sighted model. And this shows that the learn the learn the curve region actually learns a way to approximate the painting in a pretty abstract way, emphasize the general arrangement of object instead of the fine-grained details, especially in the early steps. This is another type of art style that comes from the model's mechanism instead of a human's instruction. So we believe that uh, these two explore the painting models can give us some kind of ways of having some fundamentally different mechanism behind what kind of style can be generated. It can also be a result of machine learning models, and we hope that this can be provided insight into both studying of generating model and the studying of the art styles. And uh, I'd like to say that we, we had already put the data and the related code public uh, available. We are also keeping updating this data set. Um, in the future, we plan to do a few things. For example, we plan to increase the number of facial expression images in our data set by not only having more labels, labeled images, but also building a machine learning power human in the loop annotation mechanism that allows us to scale the labeling process by having the model to propose good quality candidate and uh, having the expert to only correct if needed, which has been discussed earlier by Alexis and uh, Chicago. We believe that we also want to, in the future, construct new data sets which will help expand in the machine learning research and its application for Japanese art way beyond the faces image considered in this calculate data set. So as a conclusion, uh, we deal with the problems in the classical Japanese art. We created the data set and we show its perspective in many ways, especially in the creativity applications. So thank you very much. And if there's any quick question I can answer, I'd be happy to answer it now. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Ying Tao. Uh, before we move to the overall discussion, I have uh, a few questions uh, for you. But um, first question is from me, actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just, uh, I would like to know, like, uh, how many GPUs did you use to train the GAN? I know that we wrote the paper together, but I didn't uh, participate in the GAN part. So yeah, I would oh. like to know, yeah. yeah. I think for, for this particular side, I use a GPU uh, for, but basically many code in this way can be uh, easily scaling. So eight GPU of uh, view days, definitely uh, we note that uh, the size of the, um, of the data set is uh, pretty small compared to, for example, the anime data set or for any like uh, uh, other data set used for the GAN. So actually it takes uh, a little bit less time but I think it's of the same degree of, of a complexity. Okay, thank you. And uh, one question from uh, slide due is uh, it's an interesting question. Uh, can the Kaokure identify Wakashu figure from that are common in uh, Kiyoe, something like that, but uh, sometimes it's hard to identify uh, I mean, sometimes person. I have to tell you like Wakashu is a young person in yeah, um, in, in Japanese and Japan. uh, yeah in ancient Japan but uh one thing is that the word Wakashu even they say that it's young person it, they never use this word for female so most of them are like a young boy so it's like adolescence or something like that do you think that uh, we can uh, use uh, Kaokure to identify this kind of image in the future yeah I think technically definitely that's a uh, possible with the uh, right uh, labeling and, uh, um, and uh, I think any from a machine learning perspective, as, as well as, as long as we have uh, uh, useful signals from the image and the labels, we definitely can have a model that uh, being able to, at least in some degree, achieve the task. And uh, Wakashu, Wakashu is a pretty like, a, uh, it, it's an interesting topic. It's not only about the machine learning model, it also concerns about our collection of the data our overall labeling process and uh, 
as uh, Chikahiko san has mentioned, the the understanding of the, each character by looking into the historical books. So I think um, to tackle this 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 challenge, definitely it's doable, but it also requires our uh, how to say uh, overall effort, including the machine learning side, data collecting side, and the labeling side. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. Okay. Thank. Thank you so much. And uh, okay, let's uh take a break for a few minutes before we move to the overall discussion. And uh, we got uh many questions from uh slide due. And thank yeah. you so much, Yingtao. You can uh yeah turn off, turn off your sharing. slide sharing. Yes. Okay. And uh, if you have because we have plenty of time, we have about forty minutes for the discussion. If you have any questions to add the speaker, please go to uh sli.do slide do and then add the uh, event code which is CODS12 and you can ask the speakers any question and when you uh, ask a question please specify which speaker you want to ask and then uh, I will try to ask them uh, uh, I will try to ask as many as uh, questions possible Uh, okay, so uh, to save to save the time, let's uh, start with the uh, discussion. Uh, can everyone please turn on your microphone and your camera? Okay, thank you so much for the great talks, and uh, we definitely learn a lot from uh, all of you. And we got so many questions that I will try to. Um, as uh, one by one uh, from the slide due. So uh, the first question that I would like to ask is probably for Suzuki-san. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Suzuki-san, how are art history and specialties being applied to the Kaokore project and what's the significance of Kaokore to art historians in their research? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh as I mentioned in my slide, uh, art historians' uh, specialties apply to the you uh, making metadata. Uh, cropping face and uh, correct is a very simple task, but adding metadata is a uh, uh, need to some special knowledge to Japanese art history. And another uh, one, significant to calculate. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Kaokore, uh, Kaokore itself is uh, under the, under. Uh, development, but Kaokore styles research is a very important to art, uh, art history. Art history research is uh, it is not uh, it is under peer reviewing paper, so I cannot uh, talk about detail. But uh, in Kaokore style uh, uh, facial, facial expression competing, we are trying to uh, identify a very uh, important. Uh, Japanese emaki painting scroll who wrote uh, uh, the uh, of, a painter of this emaki mono and this is a, a very uh, significant uh, role to art history. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, the next question is, I think, for uh, a few of you. So the question is uh, how accurate it is to identify the artists from Kaokore data sets. I know that we haven't uh, do it to that level yet. We yeah. haven't tried to identify artists like uh, who paint this picture from Kaokore data set. Do you have, um, do you think that it will be possible in the future or any application that's uh, close to that? I think this question is probably for Ying Tao and Alexis. Okay, uh, maybe Alexis first. Yeah, for me, it seems to be possible. Since oh. like we uh, achieved to to find like pretty correct feature maps, and we also had other research where we playing with classification, we try to look at what were the features in different artworks. So I think style recognition is possible given like good metadata for who are the artists from the start. 
And I think we could try, even if the data is, set is still small, we could have some artists and we could try some. Yeah. Okay, and what do you think, Ying Tao? Yeah, my take is that uh, I think uh, uh, I agree with Alexis that uh, it is definitely possible. Um, because I think another issue is that uh, um, given the size of the data set, actually the differences introduced by different artists should also be separated by the differences introduced by the evolving artistic style over the time or the work uh, being like made because works can be made for different audiences. And that actually, and an artist surviving works might be just limited to one of these two uh, audiences. So I think this definitely from a, uh, Model's point of view is uh, uh, it's doable, but we also uh, want to consider the data sources to make it uh, uh, interpretable for as uh, both uh, as a machine learning problem and a humanity research problem. Okay, thank you. So uh, the same questions to uh, Suzuki Sang. Do you think it's possible to label the data with the artist like who drew this uh, image in uh, the like a, yeah? Yeah, I think it is possible, but uh, I, this uh, question is related to other question uh, in slide, I think. It seems application to calculate is an artist identification. I wonder how many painters are, are identified. This question is related. Uh, Japanese, uh, in Japanese uh, artworks, mm, uh, important, and like a kokuho or a jiuyo bunkazai uh, painting is identified who, who paint this. But, Many of them uh, are not identified who is painting. And Kaokore is focused on pre, uh, pre modern Japanese uh, emakimono and a ribbon. That is, uh, many of them are not identified who painted it. So uh, I think it is very difficult to uh, uh, answer the how long to uh, I added metadata who paint these uh, faces. But, it is related to uh, art, Japanese art history research. And many Japanese art historians are uh, focused on important works. And many uh, of uh, many other works are so not so uh, not so interested, uh, interesting for many art historians. But I think uh, this uh, type of challenge can find some other aspect of art history. So uh, we can make identifies uh, painters and if we can do it i i can put the metadata to the cowboy okay thank you so uh i have one question though like uh, how many like paintings cross the vice in japan overall i mean in the whole country the pre-modern one like uh, <laughs> if we want to level of the data that in this country like uh, how many of uh, the data that we have i'm sure that it's less than like uh, the book that's written in the cursive uh, kusushichi right but um, i'm sure that it's also a lot uh, for the uh, emaki as well yeah, this is very difficult, difficult question too. Uh, I, I or uh, many, uh, I think Japanese art historians don't know how many uh, Japanese art works in Japan in, in Prebola. It is vast, very vast, uh, but uh, so it is very difficult to <laughs> answer. But uh, um, yeah, 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 so. <laughs> It is a, a Japanese art history problem, but uh, there is a lot of, uh, I, I think over 10,000 artworks are in, in Japan, but they are not uh, yet researched. And we need to put into Kaokore and we make uh, basic research data, I think. Yeah, yeah not, the, the, I exactly. think that means we have a huge, a huge room for the future work and improvements. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay. okay, thank you so much. So the next question is for uh, Yang Hua. <laughs> so uh, the question is uh, the anime uh, character generated by AI, the animations look very, very nice, but uh, the, uh, they want to know like what's your impression of the professional animator? Do you have any feedback from uh, animators who have been working in anime? Like uh, do they think like, oh, this is a really nice work or uh, there's a room for, for improvement or something like that? Do you have uh, any feedback from them at all? Yeah, yeah, that's what we are 
uh, push forward and are pushing forward. And uh, actually, uh, for the for example, uh, the, our layer separation system, um, it's, uh, it's it's a joint project with uh, uh, illustration outsourcing company called Sumo. And uh, the problem is that the real working flow is very complicated. And uh, actually, for, for example, um, to, to make uh, 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 live 2D animation clips for a uh, character always take, can take more than 500,000 yen. And uh, it's, and uh, um, uh, we, our model can reduce the, uh, um, maybe it cannot pr uh, produce very, Good result, but it uh, at least can reduce the cost of the production. So the model need itself need iterations, and you need to create a model and uh, make it a product uh, that animators use it. Then get some feedbacks and the data sets, and then refine your model. And I think um, it's what we are going to do. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think Preferred will already start using a uh, GAN in the animation production, right? In uh, some work, did you also work in that or is a different project? Yeah, actually um, we, ha oh, um, we have already press, uh, pu published a press release about uh, GAN-based and uh, GAN project collaborated with GREE. And uh, if you look at our official page, uh, of proven networks, you we shall find the news. And uh, but uh, during the development, we also find a lot of um, issues. So we are going to tackling them. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So the next question is for Alexis. Okay. So uh, because the um, the data set is so small, did you use any image augmentation? Uh, yeah, so what we did, we use like pretty standard like augmentation for, so for example, uh, when using SSD, we were lucky enough that in the library we used a lot of photometric distortion were already like implemented. So lots of like randomly changing the brightness of the image, the contrast, the saturation was done before training, before passing a training image to the network. We also swapped the channels sometimes. We also like rotated the image to maybe find new position for faces, new orientation. And uh, obviously everything was like normalized according to the data, like we pre-trained the network on, so on ImageNet. So, so that it was like matching what was done before with ImageNet. And when using like the other architectures like Faster, CNN, and Cascade, we didn't use like much uh, image uh, like uh, pre-processing on the data. We didn't like do lots of transformation or data augmentation. It was just like randomly like rotating and normalizing uh, any inputs. Okay, thank you. So, uh, uh, but uh, another question for you as well, uh, for Alexis, is that you mentioned that you trained the network with SGD optimizer. Was that vanilla SGD or more advanced variant? Uh, so it was like pretty standard XGD, so nothing really fancy except for the learning rate that was evolving depending on how well the training was going. So we have just this evol evolving learning rate that evolved like two times during the full SGD process, but otherwise it was pretty standard. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me choose the... So um, the next one is for... Ying Tao. Okay, so uh, someone asked, uh, can Ying Tao Tian write a blog about the progress of the training that model? Uh, well, <laughs> can you write a blog? <laughs> uh, I have to admit that the, the concern, the major focus of this work is on the data set and uh, show that it can be used for many, many like uh, machine learning or creativity works. And uh, the GAN used for that uh, or any other models is just a one one part of this big vision. And actually uh, the training process is pretty 
pretty like a standard as long as you can work out again that works you, you usually just uh, uh, work on it uh, you might run it a few times i didn't find the, the data set uh, uh well i have to admit i didn't um, tune it um, with much effort because um, that, that's not our major focus but i want to say that uh, as long as you can get some gain and um, running you can you can just uh, put it plug in this data set and try it so i think it's pretty standard and not too much surprise to be to be around here Okay, thank you so much. And uh, another question also for you, Ying Tao. So, uh, so what is the definition of creativity in this research? Yeah, the uh, the person asking, he said that I think it's very interesting that different few use the term in different way. So, what is your definition of creativity? Well, I believe this this question asks us for more than it uh, looks like. Uh, creativity can mean many things, and in this, uh, I. I'd like to say that in a very narrative form, the creativity shows uh, what a, a human can do or might do through the help of tools. So through the history, I would like to emphasize in this way. So through the history of the evolution of electronic music, the technique uh, by this analog or digital processing has become a tool to largely empower the digital artist in creating the music. Uh, in many, many ways by introducing, for example, more effort, more like uh, live effects, or even recently uh, through the introducing of many machine learning models. So I think uh, creativity here can be mean, mean many things, but uh, I would take it as a way to using the tools to help uh, humans' expressions to, the, to, to extend it to the full strengths. Okay. Thank you. So uh, the next question is uh, both for uh, Suzuki Sang and uh, Ying Tao. So uh, from art history perspective, can we expect that the artists use some feature to distinguish the social classes? I know that uh, in our data set, we have the social classes like a noble warrior or something like that. Did the artist use some feature to distinguish those classes? And uh, can those classes identify, uh, uh, those features identify with machine learning? Uh, maybe uh, Sisi Sang first and then Ying Tao. Yeah, I first, yeah. Uh, I, 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 I answer from my aspect of art historian. Uh, that is yes and no. Uh, we make a uh, collection of facial expressions, but uh, painter make a uh, get the uh, uh, not in facial expression. They are something uh, cross, total cross, or something. Uh, they are, they have tools, and it it is it uh, it is a uh, uh, proof of their uh, social classes. So only in facial expressions, uh, machine learning can uh, distinguish the uh, social classes. I don't think so. I need. And as a uh, something like uh, as a metadata such as what, what they have or what, what they crew, what they wear, is a need to identify. I think, but uh, something like uh, only face uh, future is uh, related to social class. So some uh, kind of social class can uh, identified by only facial expression. I think Alex Sang uh, tried to do these uh, tests, I think, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I tried to do this, so using like, for example, guided backpropagation or GradCam. So what we wanted to do was looking at what features on the original image implied, for example, a classifier to find the good classes, because we achieve, as Ying Tao showed you, re pretty good classification results for the, for example, the status. So it seems to have things that help to do this classification. And we did it and we didn't find really important things. It's always highlighted either the ads more than the face or maybe the airs or the eyes, but not really like the facial expression in general, but we tried it. Yeah, I think that, that really makes sense. And I really agree with that. So although they are usually sometimes there might be some feature to this, we can use to distinguish some uh, special cases, for example, in these paintings, usually the female nobles usually has a very long faces, but that's more like an art style at that time, instead of uh, some like uh, meaningful uh, features that's archivable uh, for 
for example, for all the status. And uh, definitely we can run some, we can, we, we have a lot of ways um, to identify which part of the image in, in the input contributes most uh, to the classification decision as Alexis has mentioned. But uh, usually, uh, although we can do that, usually the model tries to learn uh, uh, not only looking at some specific set, but uh, looking at some like a combination of uh, all these uh, input parts. And I think that's actually a good, a healthy thing so that this model doesn't, can, uh, sh should not be easily like uh, mm, fooled by some uh, particular one or two simple features. But how to, but comparing that with uh, the, what uh, Chicago san mentioned, what uh, is really meaningful as a, from a human, humanity research point of view, I think uh, that comparison itself is very interesting. So I believe that's a good question and it uh, can lead to our future discussions. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, the next question is for Yang Hua. You have like a series of questions, a few questions for you. <laughs> so uh -huh. the first one is how is the face morphing and the occlusion for anime different from the method for the real world images? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, as I mentioned in the slide, the, the where the results often generate or often generate from very long front pair and in real in real people image you seldomly saw this kind of very long front hair and uh, and the eyeball the, the eyebrows for anime characters is very thin and uh, it's quite difficult to to process the, the, those those eyeballs but if you cannot process them uh, those eyeballs well the results will never be good. So I think different from real images and anime images looks more, it looks simple, but so any kind of distortions can catch your, uh, can, can take your, can make your attention and, uh, and you should, you will, be very unhappy with the result. But for real people, um, the, since the texture itself is very complex, very complicated, so a lot of distortion can be easily ignored. I think that's the difference. Okay, thank you. So the next question is also for you. Do you have plan to share the data set or make interactive demo or for a for animation generation? Um, actually, we are making a platform for our products. And for example, for the, um, we are trying to make a crypto uh, platform for, anime, for character creation and animation creation. And the, uh, the current schedule is, um, uh, we are, it, the platform itself is still under developing, but maybe we will release more information in the end of this, this year. Okay, thank um, you. So uh, one more question for you is that, uh, okay, actually we got two questions for you. It's just got the new one. So uh, one question is, I see you put extra effort into getting generating dark skin character to work. What did you do to improve that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, the bias, the data bias in anime image is very strong. And uh, most girls have very white skins. And uh, we use some color shifting augmentation to augment our data set. Okay, yeah, I think because uh, the animation is, um, especially Japanese animation, they don't yeah. really do like a variation of a human skin or something like that. Maybe you have like a, like a lot of a color for the hair, but not for the skin, something like that. Yeah, so yeah, maybe yeah. they also like a data by as even in the anime uh, data set, right? And uh, another question for Yang Hua also is, how is your method different from Staikian or Gaokian, which could generate Western style paintings? Um, actually, for the, uh, I think you are asking about the 
creating character with precise control part. Actually, our model looks similar. Uh, it's, it's based on Gauguin, but we modified some, some, mo some basic modules to better fit our uh, editing purpose. Okay, thank you. And uh, for Alexis, <laughs> okay, uh, can can your method extend to full length anime portraits, which involve complicated complicated poses as examples instead of face only? Like, uh, can you detect um, like uh, the whole body, something like that? That's a good question because we already from the start have problem when character like faces and the full character are not like facing or sideways. So for example, if we have only the back and see only the ears, we have lots of problems finding the faces. And same goes for people that have like, for example, veils before the faces. It's really hard for the network to be trained in such, in, so that it works. So I don't know how it will adapt. It's it. We already saw that we achieved to transfer it on other Japanese art style, but still pre-modern Japanese art style. So it's pretty similar. But we never tried on like different kind of styles, so I don't know what the result would be. And if the pose is too complicated, I I'm afraid that maybe it will not work fine. So. Okay, thank you. And the next question is for uh, Yang Hu and Ying Tao, because you have been doing a lot of a generative model. So, uh, can you share the tips on how to train GANs on non-photorealistic image dataset? Did you have to do some special image processing? Any tweak on hyperparameters? Mm, so, uh, let me first, my, my take is, uh, is short. So, uh, usually, um, it really depends uh, because there are so many kinds of uh, non-photorealistic images. Um, for example, for, for the calculate we are making, uh, we didn't using much uh, tuning because although it is a painting, but it's a high high resolution scanning, it has its own texture, which it can be and it should be captured by the uh, by the model. So for our case, we didn't put much effort into tuning, but I think for the anime, that's a difference. So Yanghua, do you mind? Yeah, I think the this set quality is very important. So if you train uh, again on some junks, it will generate some junks. And so make a high quality data set cost a lot of effort. And for example, uh, and to this, uh, if you can this, and you can remove the background before the data the training and the, the model can can easily learn characters without background, but if you put backgrounds and the mode, the generated results might be, you know, uh, might be entangled with the background. Okay, thank you so much. So uh, this is the last question. I think it's for Suzuki Sang and maybe Ying Tao. Okay, so is there any relationship between Kankore and Kaokore? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Okay. I ex I <laughs> explain. Uh, yeah. This nickname Kaokore is a uh, uh, idea from uh, Professor Kitamoto, who is the director of CODH. So I think he's not so familiar with uh, Japanese subculture. So it is. I think it is a uh, only coincide. <laughs> yeah, it is a coincide. Actually, I have to reveal that uh, uh, I participated in um, proposing this uh, abbreviation. So basically, uh, as we all know, that the Kao, uh, Kao Karachi can be also pronounced the game board, but in that way, the abbreviation would be a little bit uh, um, invoking something different. So to avoid the further um, confusion, we choose one that looks simpler. So that's the answer. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much. So that's all the uh, the questions that we have. And thank you so much uh, for taking time to uh, give a talk at the COODS seminar to all of you. And thank you so much of all the participants who make uh, this uh, seminar possible. And thank you so much for a lot of questions. And uh, we hope that we will be able to arrange the uh, more seminar, interesting seminar uh, for CODS seminar soon. And uh, we will keep you posted if we have uh, the new event. So today, thank you so much, all the speakers. If you have any, do you have any comment, right? 
Do you have any more comment for the, um, this talk or anything? Okay, so then thank you so much and uh, see you again in the next uh, CODS seminar. Okay, have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.